My name is Sam Baknin and I'm a columnist in Brussels Morning. And today we're going to discuss what else? Corruption. Corruption is fun. <laughs> it's even greater fun to dissect it and discuss it. So today we discuss corruption. Corruption has become more ostentatious in the European Union with some high visibility scandals, arrests and resignations. Candidate countries are required to stamp out venality as one of the pillars and goals of their accession process. But is corruption this touchstone of good governance? Is it all that it is made out to be? Corruption runs against the grain of meritocratic capitalism. Corruption skews the level playing field. It imposes onerous and unpredictable transaction costs. It guarantees extra returns when none should have been had. Corruption encourages the misallocation of economic resources and it subverts the proper functioning of institutions. It is, in other words, without a single redeeming feature, a scourge. Strangely, this is not how it is perceived by its perpetrators, both the givers and the recipients. They believe that corruption helps facilitate the flow and exchange of goods and services in hopelessly clogged and dysfunctional systems and markets. Corruption and the informal economy get things done and keep people employed. These people believe that corruption serves as an organizing principle where chaos reigns and institutions are there in their early formative stages. Corruption, according to the denizens of these countries, corruption supplements income and helps the state employ qualified and skilled personnel. It preserves peace and harmony by financing networks of cronyism, nepotism and patronage. Bribes are paid in order to limit choice and eliminate competition. Consequently, in corrupt environments, consumers pay less than optimal prices. That much is agreed. The difference between the competitive price and the new post-corruption cost equals the amount of bribe paid in cash or in kind. Corruption amounts to a unilateral transfer from the consumer's pockets to the manufacturers. In times of economic crisis, consumers tend to shop around. In other words, they prefer price competition and encourage it via their behavior. Producers, manufacturers tend to collude in order to fix prices. In recessions, businesses regard consumers as enemies and vice versa. Producer firms court consumers but they also seek to limit their choices by channeling their purchases and determining their preferences. 20 years ago, I proposed a taxonomy of corruption, venality and graft. I suggested this cumulative definition. 1. The withholding of a service, information or goods that by law and by right should have been provided or divulged. 2. The provision of a service, information or goods that by law and by right should not have been provided or divulged. Three, that the withholding or the provision of said service information or goods are in the power of the withholder or the provider to withhold or provide. And that the withholding or the provision of said service information or goods constitute an integral and substantial part of the authority or the function of the withholder or the provider. Four, that the service, information or goods that are provided or divulged are provided or divulged against the benefit or the promise of a benefit from the recipient. And as a result of the receipt of this specific benefit or the promise to receive such a benefit, the information, goods or services are provided or divulged. And finally, that the service, information or goods that are withheld are withheld because no benefit was provided or promised by the recipient. There is also what the World Bank calls state capture. It's defined this way. The actions of individuals, groups or firms, both in the public and private sectors, to influence the formation of laws, regulations, decrees and other government policies to their own advantage as a result of the illicit and non-transparent provision of private benefits 
to public officials. This, by the way, is prevalent not only in Africa, but for example, in the United States. We can classify corrupt and venal behaviors according to their outcomes. Number one, income supplement. Corrupt actions whose sole outcome is a supplementing of the income of the provider without affecting the real world in any manner. Number two, acceleration or facilitation fees. Corrupt practices whose sole outcome is to accelerate or facilitate decision making, the provision of goods and services or the divulging of information. Number three, decision altering state capture fees, bribes and promises of bribes, which alter decisions or affect them or which affect the formation of policies, laws, regulation, or decrees beneficial to the bribing entity or person. Number four, information altering fees, backhanders and bribes that subvert the flow of true and complete information within a society or an economic unit, for instance, by selling professional diplomas, certificates, or permits. Number five, reallocation fees, Benefits paid mainly to politicians and political decision makers in order to affect the allocation of economic resources and material wealth or the rights thereto. Concessions, licenses, permits, assets privatized, tenders awarded, all subject to reallocation fees. To eradicate corruption, one must tackle both the giver and the taker. History shows that all effective programs shared these common elements. Number one, the persecution of corrupt high-profile public figures, multinationals and institutions domestic and foreign. This demonstrates that no one is above the law and that the crime and the crime does not pay. Number two, the conditioning of international aid, credits and investments on a monitored reduction in corruption levels. The structural roots of corruption should be tackled rather than merely its visible symptoms. Number three, the institution of incentives to avoid corruption, such as higher pay, the fostering of civic pride, good behavior bonuses, alternative income and pension plans, and so on. Number four, in many new countries in Asia, Africa, Africa and Eastern Europe, the very concepts of private versus public property are fuzzy, and impermissible behaviors are not clearly demarcated. Massive investments in education of the public and of state officials are required. Number five, liberalization and deregulation of the economy, abolition of red, red tape, licensing, protectionism, capital controls, monopolies, discretionary non-public procurement, all these are essential to the reduction of corruption. Greater access to information and a public debate intended to foster a stakeholder society also help. And finally, strengthening of institutions, the police, customs, courts, government, its agencies, tax authorities, under time limited foreign management and supervision were needed. The most potent remedy against corruption is sunshine, free, accessible, and available information disseminated and probed by an active opposition, uncompromised press, and assertive civic organizations and NGOs. In the absence of these, the fight against official avarice and criminality is doomed to failure. With them, it stands a chance. Corruption can never be entirely eliminated, but it can be restrained and its effect, effects can be confined. The cooperation of good people with trustworthy institutions is indispensable. Corruption can be defeated only from the inside through the though with plenty of outside help. It is a process of self-redemption and self-transformation. It is a real transition.